Good afternoon. I don't think my mic's on. Is the mic on now? Yeah, great. Um, can everyone hear me okay, yeah? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Good. Yeah. At the back? Yeah. yeah, good. So, first of all, welcome uh, to committee room one. It's the worst committee room in the parliament, I should add. I spent many a hour sitting in here debating legislation. It, there's no windows in here, is why I don't like it. You don't get the nice view that you get up on the top floor. So I do apologise that they've stuck us in the basement, but I'm extremely grateful uh, for you taking time out uh, during festival, uh, during a really busy August, and what seems to be, surprisingly, a nice day outside to come and join us in your parliament uh, for the Festival of Politics, and particularly for this session. So I'll start by introducing myself for those who don't know me. I should apologise um, that... Um, I probably look a bit of a mess. I had COVID for two weeks and then I fell off my bike a few days ago. So I'm all bandaged up, bruised and broken. And this is my first day out of the house for a while, only to come and talk about Section 28. I really am a glutton for punishment. So um, I am a conservative MSP, I should add. So it'll make more sense in a minute. Um, so I'm Jamie Green. I'm a member for the West of Scotland region. This is my second session uh, of the Scottish Parliament. I got re-elected in 2021. Um, and uh, I've been... Uh, a, the convener and was actually the founder of the Parliament's uh, LGBT plus cross-party group. Um, and the reason I say that surprisingly is when I joined the Parliament, I thought there would have been one and I was just going to turn up and join it. I didn't realise there wasn't one. So I took it upon myself, rather controversially, uh, to set one up. And with the amazing support of the Equality Network, who uh, Tim uh, leads, and you'll hear a lot more from Tim shortly, um, who have been the secretariat of that group. We've gone on from strength to strength over the years. Uh, we've had a, a genuine good cross-party um, effort. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, good support from MSPs from right across the political spectrum, and many of our uh, cross-party group members have gone on to become government ministers and cabinet secretaries and have had to, to leave the group. I currently co-convene the group with uh, Maggie Chapman of the Greens. Prior to that, I co-convene it with Patrick Harvey of the Greens, so obviously... Uh, it's been an interesting journey for all of us in the last couple of years. Uh, but I'm always grateful for, this, for the support that I've had. And uh, we'll maybe talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, people are welcome to, to join the group uh, if you're interested. But the topic of today uh, uh, is Section 28. Um, this is actually nearly the 20th year, the 19th year, that the Parliament has held the Festival of Politics. And a lot of people actually were asking in today's world, do we still need to hold a festival of politics, when there's so much else going on outside of the parliament in Edinburgh. Um, and I think the answer to that clearly is yes. There are still issues which, like we're going to discuss over the next hour and a half, that clearly are historical issues, but still have a relevance today. Um, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of that. I want this to be a fairly interactive session. It's not just a bunch of panellists talking to you. I should also uh, tell you that this session will be uh, live streamed. Um, and I believe recorded it is being streamed on the Scottish Parliament's SPTV. Um, if you are interested in what's been said and you are of a social media nature, you can uh, uh, tweet or X at Visit Scott Parl or via our Instagram account. Um, and I, they've no idea what they haven't told me what the hashtag is, but you can make one up. Um, but I should tell you that whatever you do say may be taken down in evidence and as I've learned the hard way, used against you in the future. So um, we're very lucky uh, to have a really good panel uh, with us today. I'll let them introduce themselves because you'll hear enough from me later. So we'll start with Tim. Great, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. So my name is Tim Hopkins. Uh, I use he, him pronouns if you want to refer to me at all. Uh, I'm the director of the Equality Network. The Equality Network is one of the LGBTI campaign groups in Scotland. Uh, we've been going for 26 years. We started just before the Scottish Parliament started. Uh, and that meant we were involved in the campaign to repeal Section 28. That was in 2000, so 23 years ago. Uh, but I've been involved in what was then called lesbian and gay, or at best lesbian, gay and bisexual campaigning right from the kind of mid-1980s. So I was involved in the campaign to try and stop Section 28 when it was first introduced. That was in, uh, well, it was introduced in the, at the end of 1987 uh, and passed in May 1988. So this badge here 
that says ban clause 28 dates from 1988 from that campaign and then we had another campaign which this badge dates from in 2000 which was the campaign to get this parliament not in this building at that point uh, but to get this parliament to repeal section 28 and uh, well i've got loads that i can tell you about worry, both of you, those both of those campaigns um, our next panelist uh, jim uh, my name is Jim Plano and uh, I've been active in lesbian and gay political campaigning since talking to Tim about this. Memory gets a very, very hazy. I think about 7980, I was on Lesbian and Gay Switchboard um, in Glasgow and that was the first thing that community organisation I became active in. Uh, I was also active in the uh, campaign to prevent Section 20, at the Glasgow Committee, um, and we had the first ever uh, march in a public demonstration in, in Glasgow around lesbian and gay issues in uh, probably 88, but it might have been 87. Janie Buchan um, was there and uh, Ian McKellen uh, came and spoke and did a really powerful soliloquy um, about uh, uh, strangers and I see strangers and it's a, a, a Jacobean soliloquy and it was a very powerful event. Um, I also attended the, uh, the first major national march um, in Manchester. And to those of you who are of a certain age, and I'm looking around, there's not that many of us of a certain age, but uh, Brookside was a very, very popular uh, programme in the 1980s. It might have been popular in the 70s. I can't remember when it started. Um, and the cast of Brookside um, attended that march from the, the uh, balcony of Manchester City Hall, which was very supportive of the campaign against Section 28. Um, thousands of, of gay men and lesbians started shouting, Sheila, Sheila, Sheila. It was a massive chant um, because uh, the actress who played Sheila was one of the big signatories against uh, Section 28, and she appeared on the spoke, actually, at that rally. Um, Lots to say, and uh, hopefully it won't be boring, but um, uh, please don't pin me down in dates, because as you can see, I can hardly remember any of the years at this point. But um, yeah, lots to say about Section 20, and lots to say about um, the culture that um, thrived, the swirling around in a cesspool of our own making culture, which thrived during the 1980s, from which Section 28 emanated. Thanks, Jim. And of course, we're, we're looking at Section 28 as it was introduced to the UK Parliament. We're going to look at the context of here in Scotland and what it meant to education here in Scotland and how that's changed over the years, which leads us nicely into an introduction from Rona, who's here representing the Thai campaign, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with their good work. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, yes, my name is Rona Hampton. Uh, I am a, a Programmes and Delivery Officer for a Thai Time for Inclusive Education, which is a Scottish educational charity which uh, works with specifically LGBT inclusive education and came out of the Thai campaign and the work of uh, Thai's co-founders and directors, Jordan Daly and Liam Stevenson. Uh, I'm also a qualified history teacher myself. I taught in secondary schools uh, until I began doing this role full time. So. Obviously, I, uh, I'm not here to necessarily talk about my personal experience too much with Section 28. I'm a little bit younger, but I, uh, my expertise is around where LGBT inclusive education is in Scotland today, what we're doing to try and push aside that legacy of Section 28 and how we are supporting uh, LGBT young people in our schools today to try and make their lives and their experiences in education better. Thank you very much. Um, I guess we'll start from the beginning. I, I'm going to take it that there's a broad understanding that people understand what Section 28 was all about beyond just the headline or the words and the numbers. Um, but I think we, it might be helpful if we do go back in history, perhaps even for my benefit. I was eight years of age when it was introduced, um, so don't blame me. Um, but it is really important that we do understand where it came from uh, and also the context in which it was introduced and the subsequent repeal. So a little bit of a history lesson, I think, which will set the scene so we can look at some parallels, I think, with, with today, which is really important. Just to let you know how, how you can involve yourself in the conversation, um, we are going to have a, a bit of a chat amongst ourselves. I've got a few questions for the panel to get as much uh, out of them as we can, but equally, I would like you to, to get involved as well. So um, I'm going to de dedicate some specific time, it's probably about the last half hour, even more perhaps, where, where it's just time for you 
uh, to ask questions and speak and share your, your thoughts, feelings and views as well. So if you do have questions based on what you're hearing during our discussion, jot them down or park them on your phone or in your head and, and please do ask lots of questions. Um, what we will do, is there a roaming mic kicking about when they get to that point? Yeah. So rather than do that during the chat, we'll do that at the end. It's easier for the, the chap and the, the audio. Um, but if something really does grab your attention, just, just put your hand up and wave furious, furiously at me. If you do get the microphone to speak, uh, please introduce yourselves. You don't have to. Um, but for example, if you do represent an organisation, for example, or you have a specific interest uh, in the subject, do share it with us. If you don't prefer to stay anonymous, that's perfectly fine as well, given that we are streaming the meeting. Um, Tim, I'm going to start with you, and I'm going to respectfully ask, because I know uh, we, <laughs> we've been in a lot of meetings over the years, um, to keep it succinct and specific. Yeah. What on earth was Section 28? Okay, so, so Section 28 said, a local authority shall not promote homosexuality and shall not promote the teaching in schools of the acceptability of homosexuality as a pretended family relationship. Uh, There's quite now, a lot in that already, uh, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, exactly. Uh, so we can talk about what impacts that had. Only one, there was only one case that went to court about it, and that was right at the end of its existence in Scotland in 2000. But it had, had much wider effects, and Rhoda and Jim are better qualified to talk about those because the main effect was in schools. Um, I'll maybe say a little bit about the background to how it happened. So if you look at the figures, there's been research done for a long, long time in the UK about people's attitudes towards homosexuality. And the basic question is, do you think homosexuality is wrong? And if you look at the percentage of people who think homosexuality is wrong, in the 1980s it was actually going up. And the worst point was 1987, where it was a large majority, something like 75%, of people thought homosexuality was wrong. And that was the background for Section 28 that was introduced at the end of 1987. Uh, so why did that happen? I think there were three reasons. One is a backlash against what people called the permissive 60s. So in the 1960s, there were socially liberal moves in a number of areas. There was the decriminalization in England and Wales, but not Scotland, of sexual relationships between men. There was the decriminalization of abortion and so on. But in any change like that, it's difficult and you get a backlash. So that was the first factor, the backlash against the permissive 60s. The second, back, the second factor, unfortunately, was HIV. HIV was, a, was I have to say, it was a gift to people who were homophobic uh, because they could say this shows that we were right all along and they did, they did say that, there were dreadful things said. Uh, and the third reason is political expediency. Uh, the Conservative government in the 1980s wanted to find ways to bash Labour and Labour had adopted in the mid 1980s a platform of supporting lesbian and gay rights and the Conservatives thought this is a good way to bash Labour. And they talked about the loony left. The loony left was the term that was used then in the same way that woke is used to attack people now. Uh, and Margaret Thatcher made some dreadful speeches uh, at one party conference. She said, children who ought to be taught traditional moral values are being taught they have an inalienable right to be gay. Uh, and that was the background for the introduction of Section 28. So the Tories used it as a way to bash Labour. So you talk about the, the context there and, and people's views of the world. Um, the, the briefing that I had was that in 1983, in the social surveys, 50%, so half of the British population, believed that sexual relations between two adults of the same sex was always wrong. Not a little bit wrong or maybe sometimes wrong, but always wrong. That same survey four years later, that had risen to 64%. Mm -hmm. And as you say, it went higher and higher as the 80s went on. Um, it's, it's interesting you make the three links uh, between the, the general wider con context of just social values do change. We, we were... You know, there were all sorts of horrible views about all sorts of groups of people uh, for a long time, which over time changed through change. Um, and the legacy of that was difficult, and that was a, a contextual societal thing. Um, but I'm interested in the, the last two points. One is that you, your, your belief that this was fueled by 
uh, the HIV pandemic at the time. And secondly, this relationship between national government, which actually was doing quite well at the time and probably didn't need niche issues to fight. You know, wh why was there a need for a culture war in the 80s when they were polling so high and winning elections? Or is it the fact that 75% of the population weren't homophobic, but were a little bit homophobic, or it wasn't always wrong, but it felt a little bit wrong? Was that just political experience in its truest form, in the sense of the here's votes, this is how we get people on, on our side? I think it was political expediency, and I think one of the reasons for it was that they realised that the Labour Party was disunited on the issue. So I remember newspaper headlines from the late 1980s where the General Secretary of the Labour Party was quoted saying, front page of the newspapers, the lesbian and gay issue is costing us dear amongst pensioners. The Labour Party were having internal debates about the extent to which they could support lesbian and gay rights. And in fact, their chosen candidate in a by-election in Bermondsey in London, where I was living at the time in 1983, their chosen candidate was Peter Tatchell, who I'm sure many of you know who Peter Tatchell is. Uh, and the Labour Party disowned him when, it, when he was outed as gay. The Labour Party disowned him. Uh, and he, he lost the election to the Liberal Democrats in what was previously a safe Labour seat. So Labour were divided on this, just as they are now about trans equality. Uh, and that was a gift to the Conservatives, because Labour were divided on it. And how much of that do you think, sorry to press you, but how much of that do you think was inherent, genuine, heartfelt, social, moral, religious homophobia versus just political opportunism? So, so I remember... I, and I, I asked that because we are, we are going to look at the parallels between then and now. So I, I remember people saying at the time, Margaret Thatcher is not homophobic, she's got gay friends. And that may well have been true. Uh, but that didn't stop her making speeches like the one I quoted earlier on. And it didn't stop her supporting the introduction of Section 28 and, and attacking Labour over these issues. So, so my answer is that for her, it was expediency. Obviously, there were quite a lot of MPs and certainly religious leaders and so on for whom it was a much more fundamental uh, dislike or, or disagreement uh, with same-sex relationships. Yeah. Um, thankfully, that, that has changed. Uh, and, and, and I'm hoping one of the positives that will come out of today's session is that things definitely have changed, but not, not in every area, as I'm sure we'll, we'll come to talk about. Jim, you, you were a teacher at the time. I understand, as well as an activist. Were you a teacher before you were an activist or were you an activist because of what happened? Uh, no, I was active in, in the lesbian gay movement from uh, 79 when I left university. I began teaching in 1988. Uh, so that was just after the introduction of Section 28. So um, uh, my teaching career began as Section 28 began as part of... Um, we both have, uh, both myself as a teacher and Section 28 have the same birth period. Um, culturally, we're akin. What, what did it mean, though? I mean, so, so Tim's explanation of the, the technical, what it actually meant was that you couldn't... What, what was the phrasing? You couldn't promote uh, same-sex... Couldn't promote the acceptability of homosexuality as a pretended family relationship. Pretended family schools, relationship. Okay, which is pretty means. horrible if you think about yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, how, how do you best undermine and attack lesbian, gay and bisexual people. What, what makes us as lesbian, gay and bisexual people different from everybody else? Well, the only thing that makes us different, really, is that we have same-sex relationships. So to say that our relationships are unacceptable and pretend relationships fundament is a fundamental attack on lesbian, gay and bisexual people, and, and that was quite deliberate. So, Jim, how did that filter into schools? Because the, the conversation tended to focus around what this meant in the teaching environment. Yeah. Um, so I, I appreciate there was a link between local authorities, local authorities being responsible for education and materials and resources and so on, but also teaching methodology, curriculum practices. Uh, I presume at a time when there was an increase in, in, in more of a, you know, a social element to, to education where people were starting to learn about sex ed and relationships, drugs, etc., which are things that were, you know, we now deem to be quite appropriate to be teaching. Um, but back then probably were quite controversial to be introducing into schools, where, which I presume were just places for learning how to read, write, and you know, that sort of thing. How, what did Section 28 actually mean in a, in a teaching environment? Section 28 um, was extremely effective 
as a piece of legislation in censoring, uh, uh, causing self-censorship within the education system. Completely ineffective legally. Um, any of us, I mean, uh, um, apologies to anybody who's a lawyer uh, present, but I think even a layperson could uh, look at those, those words and think, I could probably put quite a good case against what is legally a pretended family relation. What, what could that mean? So, uh, and, and that, as Tim mentioned, there was one instance at Glasgow City Council um, where a, a case was taken against the council. And interestingly, in that instance, the council immediately withdrew funding. Uh, I was chair of the, the uh, HIV and AIDS project, Face Scotland, at that point, and uh, we had a, you know. Uh, teams of, of workers and uh, it was a very difficult position for us to receive a letter, immediate withdrawal of, of funding. That's because the local government, the council, was frightened of what that might mean. Teachers, likewise, were very frightened of what it might mean. Um, consequently, what they did was not deal with it. That's basically the way uh, uh, that's a tried and tested teacher method. Um, when you're not sure what you're doing, just don't do it. The, uh, and uh, uh, that meant that lesbian and gay issues within the curriculum were zeroed. It meant that uh, l lesbian and gay teachers felt very, very intimidated. You've got, I, I think, to be aware of the fact that at that point, and I know Rowan is going to go on and give us some really good news about some of the great things that Ty has been able to do and is delivering in the education system, even employment rights, um, it was completely legal to dismiss a person on grounds of homosexuality. That was a, the, the, all the kinds of cultural things that we live with around equality and around equal rights didn't exist. Um, what did exist was if a local authority had said in its policy uh, structures, which the GLC was one, Glasgow Strathclyde Region was one, and uh, after that Glasgow City Council and other local authorities, if they voluntarily said they would not dismiss somebody for being gay or lesbian, that gave you protection. So when I was a teacher, I was protected, but other workers um, were dismissed. In fact, uh, there was a, a quite an interesting case that went to employment tribunal, which just e evidences the culture at that point. And it, the dismissal took place on the grounds that the person was gay, and uh, it was manifestly obvious that prejudice against homosexual people would damage the business. So lawyers decided to defend that on the grounds of uh, supporting the person who had been dismissed on grounds of you have to prove that there is widespread prejudice against uh, uh, gay and lesbian people. Consequently, that would affect uh, uh, your business. It wasn't that the lawyers thought that wasn't the case. It was they thought it would be quite difficult to prove. But the Employment Tribunal decided that it was a manifestly obvious that there was um, uh, prejudice and uh, discrimination against gay and lesbian people. Consequently, the employer didn't even need to prove it. It was just taken as a given. And that kind of states where the country was. Um, when I said earlier about swirling around in a cesspool of our own making, the National Lesbian and Gay Pride uh, March in whatever it was, 84, don't quote me in any of these, these years, but it's around that time. It had a large banner over, the, over in Kennington Park when it was a much smaller affair at that point. And uh, those words were, were put across, uh, they were at the very front of the march, if I remember rightly, because the Chief Constable of Manchester, James Anderton, had said that uh, homosexuals were swirling around in a cesspool of their own making. Later on, his daughter came out as gay, which um, uh, caused you know, family issues, but... Yeah, God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> um, the, uh, but again, that's part of the culture. That's part of the culture that within which Section 28 took place. Section 28 was a bit like, and if anybody speaks Gaelic and have read the blog I've done for the Scottish Parliament in Gaelic, I mentioned this, uh, that in Alabama, sitting at the back of the bus degrades you. It makes you a second-class citizen. And it ensures that you, throughout your life, understand that you are not as good as everybody else. And that's what Section 28 did. It told gay and lesbian people, you aren't as good as everybody else. You are most definitely a pretended, you know, your family relationships are pretense. You're not real. And uh, uh, consequently, any mention of you 
is dangerous to the body politic, to, to, to good ordinance in, in, in society. And that's what it did. And that's what it did. A bit like sitting at the back of the bus. You get on the bus to your work and every day you're reminded and told that you're not as good as everybody else. You're certainly not as good as the white people at the front. And that's what, what Section 28 was about. It was about degrading and it was about creating an atmosphere of discrimination. Um, there is a really good documentary, and I watched uh, part four last night. We, we were watching it uh, 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 at home on Sky Atlantic, not punting Sky Atlantic, but that's what it's on, uh, called Last Call. And it's about ser uh, serial killer in New York. And it sets the killing of gay men, a serial killer killing gay men in a political context. And it's really, really interesting. It's, it's about um, uh, what happens about uh, how serial killers, why they kill uh, uh, gay men but the context, the political and social context that festers and creates mm. disturbance like that. And that's what Section 28 was part of. It was part of a social disturbance. It was part of social discrimination. And it's part of a much bigger picture, um, which uh, luckily we're no longer in, and anything like the same uh, uh, venom that was around at that point. And I'm sure Rowan has got lots to say about, about trials that she still has. I know Ty still has, has difficulties in schools, but um, not uh, uh, what it was like when I, when I began teaching. Mm, thanks for that, Jim. It's very personal experiences. And it's interesting you talk about the, uh, the, the serial killer documentary. Uh, th those of us who remember the bombing of the Admiral Duncan in Soho, uh, or, uh, I, I remember going to it the day they reopened, and I was too young to really understand the context of how it, they got to where they were in London at that time. Um, but I remember w walking down Old Compton Street for the first time, I think I was 18, possibly 17, don't tell anyone, uh, I still went in for a drink. Um, and there were purple, definitely purple, it was vivid in my memory, balloons outside and it looked like a big party and I went in, went to the bar and I said, what are we celebrating? It's completely naive. And uh, they said, oh, it's our first day reopening after the bomb. And then I suddenly remembered. And my first thought was, I better not tell my mother where, there, where I've been. Not because I'm in a gay bar, but because she'll be, you know, petrified and terrified of what might happen. And that was, that was only in, you know, the late 90s. So the culture, even then, was, was difficult. Um, just before I move on to Rona, I did want to ask you something specifically about this notion of how Section 28 affected teachers and teaching. Is it the case that the the advice, if you like, the legislation was quite specific, but the interpretation of it could have been quite vague? So was it that, were people just saying, look, let's just not mention the word gay at all in a school environment, because what will happen is we're going to have an angry parent come in and take us to court, or I'm going to lose my job? Was it, was it just as simple as that? Or do you think there was homophobia in the teaching environment amongst head teaching? Uh, or, or did they just say, let's just stay away from that whole subject because I'm, we're petrified of breaking the law? I think both things are true. I think the effect of Section 20 educationally was to ensure, um, amazingly effective, I mean, for something that's so poorly drafted and so poorly constructed, really effective. Um, it just, should, you know, teachers follow rules. They just follow the, you know, the bell goes and you get out of the staff room and, you know, everybody lines up. We all, we all come from that culture of kind of order. So teachers are kind of ingrained in following um, that kind of structure. And that happened with Section 28. In terms of homophobia within, the, uh, within education, absolutely manifest. Um, continuous. Um, when I uh, I was involved uh, in the, the repeal, the Scottish campaign for repeal, um, I was a head teacher by this point. I was put under a lot of pressure, um, you know, like three, four phone calls, personal phone calls from the director and senior officials. Get off the TV. Stop doing this. You have to. You have to stop immediately. Um, and. Uh, uh, I distinctly remember um, a, a tense conversation because it's your career at this point, you know. Mm. I didn't think I was going to be dismissed because I didn't think they'd, the cojones to do that and I didn't think they would want to do that. But um, uh, uh, I knew this was the end of my career at that point. The, the director never spoke to me ever again after, after this, blanked me at all meetings. And uh, it, I get further promoted, but only when he'd gone. Um, 
And uh, uh, I said to the Deputy Director at that point, this is a national emergency for my people. Um, and I kind of thought of Chrysler Isherwood's um, uh, uh, descriptor of our poor, banish, uh, our poor uh, uh, battered tribe is what he called gay and lesbian people uh, and Chris Richwood, the writer. And I kind of thought of our poor battered tribe at this point, and I thought about that both uh, in the beginning of Section 28, when it, uh, we campaigned against it. Um, the Labour Party supported Section 28 at the very initial part of it, um, and then they kind of freaked and kind of moved position. Some of us will remember that, because I can see some faces who, who uh, were as aghast as, as uh, others were. Um, Maureen Calhoun, Tim mentioned about Labour Party uh, difficulties at the time. Maureen Calhoun was a lesbian MP who was deselected, 82-83, uh, um, on grounds of you cannot field gay and lesbian candidates, because if you do, you're going to lose. Um, and one of the reasons that Peter Tatchell lost in Bermondsey, he was the official Labour candidate, was that a, a, a real Labour candidate stood and got about 8,000 votes or something like that. In other words, the Labour Party votes split into two groups, apparently real Labour, which was homophobic Labour, which had, you know, a good wealth of, of support and the Tatchell um, official Labour campaign which was denigrated by the, the official Labour leadership in various ways. So um, within education, education mirrors culturally the country we live in. So we get an education system that's kind of like what our country's like. Um, and uh, our education system was homophobic. Um, our practices as teachers were homophobic. And in my view, and it is a personal view, but I can back it up with evidence, um, the, uh, it was not a career move to be gay or lesbian within education. Practically all people I knew, and there was lots of them who were gay or lesbian, uh, uh, who were teachers, were closeted. Um, and just a kind of wee anecdote. I remember during the Section 28, the second one, the, when we repealed it in Scotland, a head teacher who was gay, uh, I knew she was gay, um, Saw her in the corridor. I mean, she, you know, wouldn't. I was kind of a bit like a notoriety person, a bit like Quentin Crisp, like kind of, you know, association with John Manuel meant, you know, how do you know him? Kind of thing, you know. Uh, sometimes people would, you know, jump to conclusions. I knew her and I knew she was gay. We were alone in the corridor and it was you know, only me and her there and she pretended still that she didn't know me. And I kind of thought, look, Nobody else here but you and me. I mean, I'm not going to go in there and say, by the way, she's a lesbian. I'm not going to do that. But that level of ingrained um, discrimination meant that people felt so repressed and uncomfortable, that even on a one-to-one -one basis, nobody else there. I can't really recognise that he knows he's seen me out with my partner out drinking in gay bars. So I, I, I just can't do that. I can't make that step forward. And that's what education went. That would be 2000, 2001. So we're not talking about 35 years ago. We're talking about much more recent times. Um, and uh, culture change takes ages. Um, Rona knows that better than anybody else because she's working in the system just now. It takes a long time to shift the, the big barge of culture. Um, and within that, Section 28 fed that amongst teachers. It fed, just as, just as you're saying, that sense of don't touch this, I'll get into trouble, bad for my career. A lot of things are true. If you did touch it, it would have been bad for your career. <laughs> it would have caused you grief. You probably would have got told, don't dare do that again. Um, my cousin was gay. Um, and she uh, was, became out as gay, and this would be early 90s, um, maybe late 80s. So times are, are, are uh, a bit kind of hazy. And what happened then was that uh, she, went, she was taken before the Education Committee, and the Education Committee responded to her. She was an excellent teacher, superb teacher. What they said to her was they could find no evidence against the, the research in her entire career. Purely on grounds of being gay, that, that was it. There wasn't really much else that, that, to, to be done. 
their response to it, and sometimes psychologically the words people use tell you everything about their approach, we could find no reason um, to uh, proceed with dismissal. In other words, we have been looking for a reason <laughs> to find a way to get rid of you, and we can't find it. Sadly, we're going to have to keep employing you. And that says something about what education was like and what teaching was like. Um, and uh, EIS conference, I spoke at EIS conference in 2000, 2001, at the repeal campaign, and we knew there was a, 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 a vociferous uh, element within the union that was for Section 28, active and uh, 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 spreading uh, amongst the union. Um, and I remember speaking at, at uh, uh, EIS conference, and I told the EIS conference, Scotland's watching us as teachers to see what we think about repeal. And if you vote for um, repeal tonight, Scotland will listen and think that teachers have got a viewpoint which is contrary to what uh, Souter and, and uh, Keep the Clause were saying. Or if you vote for keeping Section 20, Scotland will also listen to that. And uh, that, that will... Uh, what now, was the result? EIS conference voted for repeal. And the group who were for Section 20 were heavily marginalised because I knew during the day that they had more support than they finally got in the final vote, which was testament to the work we did. Um, there's a group of us who spoke for, for repeal. Um, and uh, one of the things I said was, uh, uh, I'd been in Lesbian and Gay Switchboard from whatever it was, 79, 80. Um, and I remember one night being on Lesbian and Gay Switchboard with a, uh, 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 somebody else on the team who was an older guy than me, I was a young chap at the time, um, and he got exasperated with me doing my usual sort of leftist thing about join a union, join a political party, you know, gay and lesbian people need to get active, blah, blah, blah. And he said, <laughs> he snapped at me because he basically had enough of this young guy who knows nothing, and I didn't have the life he'd, he'd, he'd led. He was, uh, he'd probably been in his 50s at that point, so this is kind of 80s, so he would have been born in the 30s, rel relatively. Diff lived a different life for me. And he said, what you don't understand, Jim, might have been more pleasant than, I don't know where he even used my name, but what you don't understand is they hate us. They've always hated us. He meant straight people. And there's nothing you can do about that. Nothing. All we can do is build our own organisations, like Switchboard and other things, community centre or whatever. Um, and I said to EIS at uh, conference tonight, prove them wrong, because I don't recall anybody else in EIS conference, hundreds and hundreds of delegates, I don't recall, recall anybody else who was gay or lesbian at that, at that conference. Yeah, um, move on. Prove them wrong, and they did. And uh, they did prove them wrong, because that is not the case. That every straight person hates every gay or lesbian person. Not true. But it felt like that sometimes. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, that sounds utterly depressing, Rona. Is it still as bad as it was? <laughs> Prove us wrong. <laughs> yeah, I certainly think it's not. Um, I could say it's as bad as it was. I really genuinely wish that I could sit here as, uh, on behalf of Ty and the people currently out doing this work in schools to try and uh, help uh, LGBT inclusive education roll out across the country. I wish I could sit here and say that it's all better, things are so much better, and it's, it's all good news. But, um, and there certainly is good news, and I, I will get to that in a moment, but I think it is important to first establish where we currently are at uh, in Scottish education uh, as someone who is obviously working in this field. I think, as Jim said, um, culture is very slow to change. I think uh, schoolyards and school communities are especially slow. They, uh, there's a real... Um, I think sometimes what people forget is that for... Children, the people who are most uh, present in, in building their worldview is their parents. And that means you're usually talking one or maybe two generations older than that young person. I think it's very easy for us to look at children and young people today and think, oh, they're so progressive, they know so much more, look at our culture that they're growing up in. And of course that has an important impact. But ultimately, when they're young, what they're hearing, the people they're hearing from the most are people who are 20, 30, 40 years older than them. And that's where you can get this real delay sometimes in 
things that we see in all, our culture and how that is filtered down to young people. Certainly by the time young people are moving up into mid, late secondary, they are far more absorbing things from the culture around them, from their peers, from their friends and celebrities and on the internet. But for, for young people in schools, when we are talking about where some of the homophobic language, the homophobic behaviour sit in, uh, in primary schools, it is young children who are eight, nine, ten years old who are starting to hear things that we would like to hope were left far in the past. Uh, homophobic language, the very class that like, oh, that's so gay, is still incredibly prevalent in schools across Scotland and the UK, I'm sure. Um, we certainly have been in schools doing our work where we have heard slurs uh, thrown around and often not even us, you'd think maybe us going into a school would provoke this behaviour. But no, we, I've walked through school corridors where I just heard it from one child to another, or a young person really, teenager to another teenager. Um, not because we've provoked it, but because that is just what the school community is still like. And of course, teachers are not accepting this behaviour in most cases. Teachers are often trying to do a lot to um, combat this kind of behaviour, prejudice, discrimination. But unfortunately, it is still present in our schools, um, especially for schools who have not yet started that full journey of moving towards LGBT inclusive education. What is inclusive education? How do you, how do you structure that? What, what does it actually mean? So um, in Scotland, LGBT inclusive education is a quite a specific term. It refers to a government policy area around um, how LGBT people, topic, themes and history are included in the curriculum. So when we're talking about LGBT inclusive education, this isn't about sex ed, it's not about teaching about healthy relationships. That is of course really important um, and it is vital that young people get that knowledge, whether they are straight, whether they are cis, whether they are LGBT. Um, but that's not specifically what we mean by LGBT inclusive education. LGBT inclusive education is referring to the broader teaching of themes, topics, people, successful uh, icons or role models to young people. And it runs right from early years in primary education right up through the end of secondary. It's things like um, giving young people and children an understanding of what is prejudice, not just towards LGBT people, but in the broader context. What is prejudice? What is discrimination? How may you come across these views? How do you interact online? What are you hearing in the world? And how uh, does that maybe start to shape your view? Understanding more about the basics. What what is an LGBT person? What does that mean? And some actual examples of people like, for example, in maths, you might learn about Alan Turing and the great work he did. And you will find out that actually in his life, he experienced extreme uh, prejudice that led to the end of his life, despite the incredible work he had done uh, to help uh, Britain during the Second World War. You might learn about sports idols like personal uh, person I love, Billie Jean King, but maybe someone more modern as well, like Tom Daly, and learning about how LGBT people contribute so positively and broadly to our society in general. Because I think the big thing for young people is that they so often don't hear the words LGBT. They don't hear about LGBT people. They might know a name, they might know who Tom Daly is, but have they actually ever realised that he is a gay man? And by making sure that LGBT people, themes, topics and history are included in the broad education, not just in PSE, not just in kind of sex ed, but actually in their proper and relevant and meaningful place throughout the school curriculum, we make sure that young people, both LGBT young people and uh, young people who are cis or straight, understand that LGBT people are just a normal part of our society, that we are not something to be afraid of, not something to make fun of, and not something to be scared of being associated with, which is so often what leads to the more active bullying behaviours and uh, language that unfortunately we do still sometimes see in Scotland schools. And tell me, do you think, and, and I should say you guys do great work, um, I remember uh, just after being elected in 2016 and when Liam and Jordan turned up on the, on the scene and they were I, I described them once as the, the, the militant end of acti activism at the time, but I think they had to be because no one really was listening, nor did they have any money or resource. Um, and I remember them standing at the bottom of the garden lobby, just as you'll see that in the main hall there, um, with a big placard asking us to sign the pledge as, as we get asked to sign so many pledges uh, every week. 
Um, and I was a bit unsure because, you know, obviously, you know, before politics, I was involved in, in pride events and, and my own form of activism. But, I, you know, you're always a bit nervous about putting your name to something because you don't know what that something actually is. <clears throat> and I recall at one point, most of the signatures on the board were from opposition party members. There was very few government backbenchers signing that board because I think there was probably a bit of nervousness that they didn't want the governing party signing up to some policy that hadn't been discussed or approved or, uh, or funded. And it took a bit of time and not everyone signed it. And I think at the time, they only just got over the line in terms of a majority, the majority of MSPs um, that signed the pledge. But that certainly was, was, a, was a, a, a trigger. It was certainly a, you know, a springboard to what happened next in, in terms of formal discussions with the government about policy change and actually funding this properly because everything costs money. Um, so, you know, that was a bit of a journey and that's quite recent mm -hmm. as well. Um, do you feel that that, that activism has, is still there or is it the case with so many third party organisations, the minute you get that government check, you suddenly now have to, to, to suddenly soften everything down? toe the line a little bit more so you don't annoy too many people in the teaching industry? Um, I think, to be honest, I might lose my job tomorrow if I suggested that <laughs> um, my uh, high school founders have, have given up their activist spirit. I, I certainly think they haven't. Um, just in case there is anyone in the room who's not fully aware, so um, the co-founders and uh, leaders of uh, Director Story of Thai are uh, Jordan Daly and Liam Stevenson, who led this grassroots campaign to get LGBT inclusive education as a national policy area where it was going to be consistent and uh, make sure that every young person in Scotland had access, free access to them, to an LGBT inclusive education. And as you say, I think that certainly, you know, because they kind of came up, you know, they were not people who had this long history behind them of, of activism or activism in the area of just LGBT, uh, the LGBT community. And, you know, I've no doubt that probably contributed to the, the fact that things were maybe a little bit slow to get rolling as they had to sort of prove themselves and establish, you know, what they really stood for. But I think also because of that, they've not come to this as people who are activists for the sake of being an activist. They came to this policy area and to this work because they felt a real calling to do it. Um, I won't obviously go into their full story, but I mean, essentially, the very uh, short version is that Jordan, at, when, he, when the campaign started, was a 19-year-old student who'd only just left school, had experienced horrific bullying himself. And when he spoke to Liam about this, and they had become friends, um, Liam was a, a petrol tanker driver in his 30s. He was not somebody who'd been previously involved with the LGBT community as a straight man with a partner and a daughter. It was all a bit foreign to him. But just the injustice of that story of hearing what it was like to grow up as a LGBT person in Scotland it made him just um, decide that he was not going to allow that to continue either. So they built the campaign from there and obviously you can, you can read all about it if you want the full, the full story. But um, I think certainly... Um, there is once you once you kind of achieve that funding, achieve that status, achieve um, you know the, the goals of your original campaign. I actually think if you ask them, they would probably both say to you they never envisioned when they started that they would be actually the ones delivering LGBT inclusive education in Scotland. Um, as to be fair, when I qualified as a teacher, I would never have told you that I thought I would be delivering LGBT inclusive education in Scotland. But um, you certainly have to. Um, be aware of the environment you're operating in. You need to make sure that you are pulling people in and not pushing people away because you can't go and change minds of actual teachers on the ground, of young people on the ground, if you're only going in and being super inflammatory and, you know, you need to do this my way or it's the highway. You need to go, you need to talk to people, you need to build understanding between these different communities and understand what's going to work because we always say LGBT inclusive education is not solely for LGBT young people, it is for everyone. Um, I always say to teachers when I'm talking to them, it's not the LGBT young people in your school who have a problem. They are experiencing a problem, but somebody else is putting it on them. And it's that young person. And, you know, obviously there's many reasons a young person might be lashing out, might be engaging in bullying behaviours. It might be that they have something going on that they need support with as well. 
But ultimately, this education is for everyone to make sure that the people who are engaging in these bullying behaviours are no longer doing it because they have a better understanding of the community and the society around them. And of course, so that these young uh, LGBT young people are experiencing a much better, much uh, more pleasant school life than many of us who went through school before this was a policy area had in our time in school. Yeah, I would give you a round of applause, but I can't. So <laughs> accept that as one. Um, yeah, great. No, and it, it wasn't a leading question, of course. Um, I, want you to keep, I want you to keep your job tomorrow. Um, uh, no, it's, it's, it's just it's really interesting to see how, you know, two, two people just come together and you know, in the days like the early days of, of outrage, for example, or some of the very early, um, uh, you know, GLAD and all, you know, the, the, the campaign against gays in the, the military, uh, all these very, sort of what we think of as quite historic campaigns, you know, from the 70s and 80s and 90s that young people really don't identify, maybe young gay people don't identify with, for example. But certainly are seeing that in, in a sort of modern day context, that that sort of activism still exists and unfortunately still has to exist, I think it's probably... The, the lesson to be learned. Um, do, you, do you get any, um, just before I open up to the audience, do you get any pushback um, either from pupils themselves who just come in and go, oh, what the F's this all about? We don't need to, to know any of this stuff. Um, even from teachers, dare I ask, and you don't need to be specific, and that would be unfair, um, in certain geographic areas or types of schools, um, but even from parents. And, and you know, obviously we know that there's, there, there's still maybe some parents out there who are not happy that this might be might be a feature of their, their child's curriculum? Yeah, I think that's a, certainly a fair question to ask. And, um, you know, I think anyone who's ever worked in education or just been a young person knows that not every child or young person who ever walks into your classroom is going to be super excited to be there, especially a few <laughs> times when, you know, I've maybe gone in because I deliver workshops directly to young people. And, you know, I see occasionally some people wandering in in their PE kit and I go, they're not going to be happy to be here. They were looking forward to some football. But... Ultimately, for the most part, we actually get very little in the way of pushback. We um, certainly we get questions, like, and we welcome questions. We always are very open to whether that is from teachers, parents, or young people themselves. I want young people to ask me questions. That's kind of why I'm there. I am that person who's able to come in as an outsider. They're maybe a wee bit hesitant to ask a question of their teacher if they think, oh, maybe I'll get into trouble for asking that. If they are genuinely seeking knowledge, I absolutely want them to ask me a question that I can hopefully either give them a really good answer to or at least say, you know what, I'm going to give some information f to your teacher who's going to maybe talk to your entire class about this subject, whatever it might be. Um, in terms of teachers, we still do... Um, work with teachers who have actually qualified and started their teaching uh, sorry their teaching careers under section 28 um, and and i mean a handful of times in the in the thousands of teachers we've worked with we have actually encountered people who went oh i didn't realize you could talk about this they've actually whether it's just they've kind of forgotten or maybe they missed out on the the campaigns around repealing it they actually in some cases have never realized that this is still something they can talk about and have been able to talk about for 20 years now. Um, but for the most part, a lot of teachers are very on board. A lot of teachers are trying to do this work already. Um, and part of, of what LGBT inclusive education is about is bringing those efforts together to make sure that um, there's, there's a huge amount of teachers who are doing great work already. There's a huge amount of teachers who are very well meaning and are doing things that maybe on the surface look really look really positive but aren't always having the impact they're hoping for so part of having this as an official um policy area with a sort of central uh, set of um themes and and a way of doing things that is adaptable to teachers and classrooms and individual communities of schools but ultimately lead uh, teachers in a, a guide them in a certain route towards proper inclusion for lgbt young people it's about making sure that that effort is um is going to work as intended and is, is um, consistent throughout Scotland. Mm -hmm. In terms of parents, again, parents are actually overwhelmingly supportive of this um, when we engage with them directly. Um, I'd love to do like a proper survey of, of parents to, to get more information on that, but we do have uh, some uh, research that we're doing and hoping to start in the next few months to look at teachers and young people and their experiences of LGBT inclusive education. Um, but when we talk to parents, which we do try to do as much as possible because we always want to listen and talk to and engage people properly, again, meeting them where they're at rather than trying to haul them in one go over to where we're at, um, 
a lot of parents assume that this is already happening. Mm -hmm. They actually think, oh, I just assumed that that was standard. I assumed that would be being taught. Um, again, parents might have questions. They might want to, for example, see resources because there is a lot of misinformation, especially online, about what is being taught, um, you know, uh, wh what age certain things are being taught at, all this kind of thing. But again, that's where we just our approach to that is just to be completely open because we don't we know we're not doing anything wrong so we don't have anything to hide it's a case of come look at our resources anyone in this room or on the internet could go to lgbteducation.scot right now and look at all the resources that we have up for teachers to use for example and once we find that once we have that conversation whether it's with parents or whether it's with teachers and say go look at it look at it think about how it's going to work in your classroom if you're a parent talk to your child's teacher and see what they're actually using we have all, I don't think we've ever had someone take a complaint sort of further than that or have further questions because once they see it in front of them and go, oh, this is you including Tom Daly on a list of Olympians that my child's looking at for their sports topic or it's talking about, um, you know, equal marriage as one of the series of events you're looking at in this discussion about legal discrimination. There's very actual, there's very often not, real pushback to that. Often any pushback that occurs is around this idea of what it could be rather than mm. actually the reality of what it is. Which I, uh, I'm really glad you, you raised that. You know, you're not going around schools giving out copies of Jenny Lives with Eric and Martin, are you, in a no. republished <laughs> edition from Penguin? So, um, Tim, just tell me that we're obviously glad and pleased that the, 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 that piece of legislation was repealed. But it wasn't certainly without a fight. There's a fairly large, probably quite well-funded campaign to keep uh, that legislation. Um, I, we haven't got a lot of time, but in two minutes, what yeah. on earth was that about? <laughs> so it was a, <clears throat> excuse me, it was a defining moment for this new Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Parliament started up in uh, May, June 1999. And it was towards the end of 1999 that the Labour Liberal Democrat Scottish Government announced that they would repeal Section 28. Uh, and we, the Equality Network, thought that was great. And I remember we went to the pub and uh, looked at the newspaper and there was a big headline on the front page about some of the religious bodies in Scotland starting a campaign to, uh, against repeal of Section 28. The Catholic Bishops' Conference, a conservative group within the Church of Scotland and so on. But we kind of handled that. We did some media about it. That was in December uh, 1999. And then in January 2000, Brian Souter, who runs bus companies and is very rich, popped up and said he would be spending a million pounds trying to stop the repeal of Section 28. Now, in 2000, a million pounds then is probably worth three million pounds now. In those days, it was almost as much per person in Scotland as a US presidential candidate spent on their election campaign in the US. Scotland's a small country, a million pounds was a lot of money. There were billboards all over Scotland trying to stop the repeal of Section 28. Homophobic billboards had a real impact on lesbian, gay and bisexual people's mental health. Uh, so it was six months of hell, really, for those of us who were campaigning uh, for the repeal of Section 28. I was the media spokesperson for the Equality Network, and I was on the radio pretty well every day talking about it. But it was a defining thing for the Scottish Parliament. This is what we kept saying to MSPs, is that, in effect, if you back down on this, then from then on, every socially liberal campaign, every socially liberal change that you try to make in the Scottish Parliament, the same coalition of social conservatives and religious conservatives will put the same pressure on you to try and stop it. Is that the way you want the new Scotland to be run and the Scottish Parliament to be run? And they decided not. And the repeal of Section 28 was, was passed by, I think it was 99 votes to 16. <laughs> and the 16 were all the Tories, unfortunately. Uh, so, yeah, so we won. And, and once we'd won, everybody forgot about it. And that's what would have happened with the Gender Recognition Reform Bill that this Parliament passed by almost as big a majority last December. That's what would have happened if it hadn't been for the UK government 
deciding to block it using this never before used technical thing in the Scotland Act. People would have been over it by now, but that's, that's another story. If I start talking about that, I'll get into more <laughs> trouble. I've got into enough trouble about that subject. Um, let's uh, open up now to you, the audience. Um, I don't think we can take questions from online, unfortunately, um, but certainly the conversation can continue online. And I'll start right at the very back. Um, wait till the <coughs> microphone arrives. Um, if, sir, if you have a question directed at anyone specific on the panel, do that. If it's just generic and you, you're happy for anyone to answer, that's fine as well. Okay, well, thanks very much. Uh, I'm Neil Barber. I represent a group called the Edinburgh Secular Society, and I sometimes, when they trust me to be on message, uh, I'm a spokesperson for the National Secular Society in Scotland. Uh, Tim began to hint at my concerns there just at the end. Um, we see uh, repeal of a so-called gay conversion therapy blocked by religions. Religious conversion therapy is okay. We see schools being legal, faith schools being legally allowed not to have LGBT inclusive um, sex education classes. And we see candidates for the very first ministership of Scotland standing up and saying, I'm not homophobic, it's religious homophobia. And if you're discriminating against me, you're discriminating against my religious beliefs. Uh, I, a couple of years ago, I was one of the panellists in um, the discussion of the hate crime bill. And what comes up is the, this notion of protected characteristics. There is a sexual orientation as a protected characteristics and religious belief as a protected characteristics. Now, of course, my question is, which one is a choice? But uh, this, always, this is always an issue that um, any objection to religious homophobia is countered by cries of you're discriminating against my religion. So my question is, does the panel agree with me that an equality issue is a secular issue? Um, I'm going to come, Tim, I'll come to you after. because Jim, I want to come to you first. Um, I, one of the themes that ha has came up, certainly in the last couple of years, it did come up in the hate crime legislation, I remember that debate, quite vividly, certainly came up on the last, uh, over the last 12 months on, on other pieces of legislation, qualities legislation, this idea of balancing rights. And it's a, it is tremendously difficult as lawmakers to do, um, to respect differences of opinion, to even agree to disagree, um, as I often do with people on a, a wide range of issues. Um, Jim, how do, you, how do you think that those sensitivities can be dealt with if they are heartfelt, genuine views versus phobic views or illegal views. How did, how did society deal with that? And how did society deal with the fact that, you know, there are even people of faith in the LGBT community who, you know, who, 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 who might not agree with myself, for example. So it's, it's a very difficult balancing act. It is, and uh, I think it's complex. I, I, I think particularly around um, gay and lesbian issues and religion, because um, uh, Judeo-Christian traditions and the, the Islamic tradition has got a particular view about um, sexuality and a particular view in its, in its uh, formal uh, um, uh, viewpoint around um, uh, gay and lesbian issues. That does not mean that um, religious people are one broad mass and they all think the same thing. It does not mean, for instance, that because the Catholic Bishops' Conference um, wanted to keep Section 28, every Catholic in Scotland also wanted to keep Section 28. That, that is not the case. Um, what I think is important is there must be absolute and cast-iron separation of church and state. That's absolutely imperative. Because the state is there to protect everybody. Everybody um, has a, a place in the state's mission. Um, consequently, the gay and lesbian community is part of the state. The religious community is also part of the state. And the state must protect everybody's um, rights and everybody's viewpoints. And we see those, those things playing out in the United States just now. Um, where um, you know recent Supreme Court decisions are just horrendous because they could, could lead to most terrible imbalances within the state. But part of the problem for the United States, in my view, is that separation of church and state has never been properly um, uh, delivered. 
Gore Vidal, uh, its famous comment about the, Uni the United States Constitution, uh, that it's a, a wonderful document and it should now be implemented, is, is something which is of, of interest, I think, to all of us. Um, now, within that, you, it, to actually say that a religious person is not permitted to think that my life is sinful, I don't really want that and I don't really need it. And I, being brutally frank, I just don't care. Um, now, if a religious person says, I think your life is sinful, Jim, and I don't want you employed, and I don't want you um, uh, to be able to buy a cake, and in Italy, uh, two women who, whose names are on the birth certificate, I want one of those women's names re removed because uh, uh, the Maloney government won't recognise the fact that uh, le gay or lesbian uh, families exist and can co-parent a child because that, that just can't happen. That's where the separation of church and state must be laser sharp in that the state is there to protect us all. We can all live with each other. We may have to live with disagreement. This panel does not agree on a number of issues. Um, I, there's live debate within the gay and lesbian community about all sorts of things, and long may that continue. Um, we may have different political views. We come from different, you know, all sorts of dif different backgrounds. The state's there to allow us to have an event like this, where we can celebrate um, a step forward. We can celebrate something good, something that took place that removed discrimination. But in the end, if a religious person sitting here, and I don't know if anybody is religious, who inside the head thinking, yeah, but I still think it's morally wrong, that's, that's your private um, uh, uh, personal opinion. What's private and personal is quite different from what's the state and what the state does. And that's where um, the church and the mosque and uh, any particular viewpoint has absolutely no right to dictate to or suppress the state, in a sense, and try to overturn the state. The state exists for us all. And within that, there are rights for different people to have, have different viewpoints. I am very up for having a discussion with a religious person about whether I'm a sinful person or not. I'm up for it. I, I have no problem doing that. Very relaxed about it. I do object strenuously to the state siding with any a, a discriminatory or oppressive view and then enshrining that in the state's behaviour. And that's what Section 28 was. It was enshrining discrimination and prejudice within the apparatus of the state. And that's what Maloney's doing and it's what the Supreme Court is doing in the United States. And that is extremely dangerous. And Rona, you've still got a bit of work to do. Because um, that, you know, we get the, the next generation must know that, that that is not to happen. Thank you, Jim. Um, I can't imagine you're sinful. You seem such a nice guy. I mean, I'm Me? genuinely shocked. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Not everybody thinks so. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tim, I want to ask you specifically about legislation. You've been, you've been hanging around politicians for longer than I have, which, which is all credit to you. Um, and you have the patience of a saint in that respect. But you do get into, often to the great benefit of politicians, the detail. The actual detail. What does this piece of legislation do? How does it work? How does it interact with other pieces of legislation? And this is one of the things that we often forget. Passing a law, a specific law that does a very specific thing, uh, may often have consequences or uh, interactions. And of course, there's a very live debate about that at the moment with regards to gender recognition, for example. But the, the, going back to the original question, is how do you ensure that when doing what I think probably most people in this room and watching with an interest in this, subject want to do to improve the lives of people across all communities do that in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that is meaningful but yet does not stifle people's personal objections to for example uh, certain changes or, or do you think that you know this idea that there's that we are pr pr promoting one right over another and and vice versa is that just a myth or, or is, there a, is there a happy place you can get to in legislation? So I, th I think there definitely is. I, I don't agree with the idea that equality is a zero-sum game, that if you give more equality to trans people, you're somehow taking equality away from women, which is what some people say. Or if you give equality to same-sex couples, you're taking equality away from people of particular religious faiths. It's really important that all those protected characteristics are in equality law. So, Neil, I think it's quite right that religion is in equality law, 
just look at the extent of anti-Semitism, look at the extent of Islamophobia. Those things need to be, need to be put in equality law to protect people. Um, uh, so I, I think the basic answer to your question is, uh, and Jim has pretty much said it already, is that you know, if you're a person of faith and you believe that same-sex marriage is wrong, don't get married to somebody of the same sex. But don't tell me that I can't get married to somebody of the same sex. That is it in a nutshell. Now, when it comes to the detailed legislation, that may require adjustments. When we worked on the equal marriage legislation in Scotland in 2014, there was actually an adjustment made to the Equality Act to make it absolutely clear that if you were, for example, a Catholic priest, you could not be taken to court for refusing to do a same-sex marriage, for refusing to solemnize the same-sex marriage. And, and the Equality Network supported that change to the Equality Act because it's in line with what I just said. And it was a clarification of the law rather than a change. So you can allow people to have their own religious beliefs and to practice their own religious beliefs, but you should do it without impinging on other people's freedoms. And, and in the case of the Gender Recognition Reform Bill, what we expected to happen was that there would be some tweaks to the Equality Act made by the UK government, just as they did for the Equal Marriage Bill, uh, to ensure that, you know, that the balance was maintained. But unfortunately, the UK government chose not to do that. They chose to make it a culture war thing and to block the bill altogether. Thanks. Um, it, I, it's interesting you talk about the hate crime bill. I remember one of the big debates we had, and I, I, I won't name the MSPs, but it was a, a, a really lively couple of hours in the chamber. And one of the uh, discussions was about what is said in the home in private. And this idea that if you say something homophobic, transphobic, Islamophobic, um, anti-Semitic, anti-Catholic, whatever it is, but you say in the privacy of your own home, does it really hurt anyone? Or is it only if it's anyone listens to it? It's sort of showing us you know, abuse, if you like. Um, and, and there was a really wide-ranging concept about w what is privacy. When are you allowed to have private thoughts other people are revolted by, for example, versus what is actually legal to say out loud, whether in your own home, in the bath, or in the street, or in a, a room like this. And it's a very, very complex piece of the law that we, I think we tried to get, get to the bottom of, but I'm not convinced we succeeded with that debate. Um, do we have any other questions for the panel? Um, just wave your hand furiously. I was hoping for a bit more excitement than that. But. Yes, sir. Wait, wait till we get the microphone to you for online. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go back to something that was brought up earlier. I think it was you, Jim, who talked about how uh, Section 28 was a badly written law, in a sense, if I correctly understood that. But... I wanted to ask the panel to maybe elaborate on that because from my understanding, uh, it being badly written could very well have uh, some intention behind it, could be very well intentional, the same as maybe if you look at uh, the laws that were passed in uh, Florida that don't say gay bills, which are sometimes intentionally very vague as Section 28 was to specifically scare people. Yeah, I mean, I'll start with you, Jim. I mean, do, do you think the law actually was quite specific, just don't talk about LGBT people and that's it? Um, or was it left, as you say, was it, was it, did it weasel around the issue so that it was quite hard to work out what it, what it did mean for you in that environment? I think it was very poorly drafted. And, and I think it was drafted from a place of hatred and a place of anger. Uh, and that's my view. Um, I was told by... Uh, 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 senior um, Labour politician um, that uh, what had happened was that uh, David Wilshire and I've, I've still forgotten the name of uh, the co-sponsor um, who was a woman uh, a Conservative uh, MP um, were so enraged uh, at something they'd read in the Daily Mail uh, or Daily Telegraph or something, some day, uh, one day, that one evening it was put into the Local Government Act. Quite late at night, they put this, this uh, uh, clause in. It's a clause uh, of, uh, it's called Clause 28. It's the 28th clause of this bill. And that kind of maybe says something as well. They banged this thing in with the hope of, of stifling and preventing um, uh, 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 
the, the advances they saw in terms of gay and lesbian equality that were taking place. In other words, the change in culture. My view is that if they had uh, been more serious about it, they would have got legal advice, they would have done proper work, they would have researched it properly, and they wouldn't have used expressions like pretended family relationship and uh, promote. Um, certainly one of the issues that arose after Section, 20, uh, Section 28 and during the repeal discussion was what is the legal definition of promotion? What is, it, is a teacher promoting homosexuality by saying that homosexuality exists? You could argue it isn't. It's just, you're just saying that that's, what, that's the way life is. Um, if you use the word promote, you're going to have to defend that and you're going to have to evidentially prove in a court that that teacher went into that classroom to promote something rather than just describe reality. Um, so you can almost see how the defence is quite... Even I'm not a lawyer. I could put a defence together quite, 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 quite easily and I'm sure more of us could do. Therefore, uh, if they'd got proper advice, they would get the word promote out and pretended family relationship. I mean, what could that possibly mean, you know, um, uh, that you're pretending to be a family? Well, say you say... I'm not, I'm not, I'm in a, I'm in a relationship, I'm, you know, I don't, I'm not in a family. Um, are you then still pretending to be a family or can you be forced to be a pretended family? So all sorts of, of really kind of duff bits about Section 28. Very powerful, as I said earlier on, about what it did. Um, because it made, it, what it did was, just to, to follow on from the question earlier on, um, from uh, uh, the person there at the back, it made the state part of discrimination against gay and lesbian people. It made the state uh, a place where we, gay and lesbian people, were not equal to everybody else. And that's a bit like the bus company in Alabama saying white people at the front, black people at the back. Um, the bus company decides to do that and therefore if you want to get on the bus, you're going to have to do it in a certain way unless you're Rosa Parks and you decide you're, you're just yeah, tired of being tired, I think she said. Um, uh, what, what was her comment about it? Um, so, um, that's, that, that's my view. I, I don't think it was um, properly structured. I don't think it was intent. I think it was anger and I think it was hatred. And luckily for us, uh, anger and hatred doesn't produce good laws. Um, but what it did do is provide a very effective law within the education system, particularly for many, many years. So anger and hatred sometimes plays itself out in society in strange ways. Um, and until we get rid of it, um, it, it, it was still there. Um, remember, 1.2 million people in Scotland voted to, rem uh, to keep it. Um, uh, now, we, uh, the campaign that Tim and I were part of in terms of the repeal of Section, 20, uh, Section 2A in Scotland, um, we were very clear this is not a referendum because what Souter wanted was a referendum. It's an opinion poll. But, you know, 20 years on, I think I can grudgingly say that privately, <laughs> you know, privately we knew that 1.2 million people took the effort to send back those things um, to say they wanted to keep Section 20. That displays the extreme level of homophobia in Scottish society at that point, which Section 28 uh, enervated. Ireland went through the same process with uh, 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 gay uh, uh, marriage repeal. Yeah. Sometimes you've got to have a really unpleasant debate um, and that blows open social attitudes and it raises the question and Scotland debated the question and when it came then to marriage, it was, that, that wasn't a, 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 anything like the big deal. It might have been because we'd been through the Section 28 before and people thought, well, you know, we've been told this before and actually it never happened. Um, all this flooding of schools with gay and lesbian propaganda, which um, was implied was going to happen. I, mean, I remember sitting at, at, at our meetings in, uh, in, uh, in Glasgow, our, our committee meetings, I think, have they any idea what resources are late in schools? Where did, where did, what books do they think that we've got? I mean, we don't have any books that are going to be sent anywhere. And even if there were, how could... Um, how could that happen? I mean, they don't understand education, basically. Suter and, and other people didn't understand how education operated. Um, so, um, yeah, about culture, but no, I don't think uh, they did a good job. If you ask me about um, the promoters of, of Section 20, I think they could have done it better. They could have got legal advice and created something a bit, a bit, a bit sharper. And I, I guess that leads us nicely as, as we come to a close, is some of the parallels with today. I know we could probably spend another hour and a half 
on the events of the last 12 months. Um, uh, I think we all definitely could, um, but we won't. We'll save that maybe for next year's Festival of Politics, if I'm still here. Um, so I, I do want to ask one sort of final question. That's what, what lessons can be learned? We know that social attitudes do change. Hopefully they change for the better. I, my personal views, I think they do change for the better. I still think there's always an element of society. You have hatred towards others and lack of tolerance against a whole, whole bunch of folk. But I do get the impression, certainly now, listening to some of the positive stuff that, that Rowan and Liam and Jordan talk about, that things are better. They're still not great, and there's still a lot of work to do, but they are better. And my hope is that that progress continues, and then it is a difficult journey, especially if you're part of it, especially if you're an active voice, as some of you guys have been for, for decades. And it is, it's a tough road to follow. I do get that. But what I would ask you, each of you, and, and to be brief as well, is what, what do you think is the number one lesson we can learn both as legislators in this place, of which I'm one, um, as political parties, both as, you know, uh, as organisations, but as individuals within org those organisations. What is the number one lesson we can learn from those painful experiences of Section 28, 2A, equal marriage, age of consent, all the battles that have already been fought over the last three decades that we should learn now as we go into some of these new conversations that are happening? Tim, I'll start with you. So, so I would say the first thing is it takes a long time. Uh, you know, Martin Luther King said, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. And that last part is the key part. It does bend toward justice. So, so don't give up uh, because it, it takes a long time, but things will get better. And if I may say one other thing, uh, it's the importance of visibility in coming out. I remember people saying in the 1980s, what can we do about this terrible situation we're in? And the answer being, everybody should come out. Now, it's not always possible for everybody to come out, but that visibility, not just of individuals saying, I am gay, but the visibility of gay characters on TV and so on, that really started to tip the scales through the 1980s and through the 1990s. And you see the same thing now about trans. And if you look at young people's attitudes towards trans people, and if you look at shows like Heartstopper and how popular they are, that gives me great hope for the future because I think you're going to see the same change in attitudes towards trans people. It will take a while, but it will happen. Thank you, Tim. Jim. Yeah, I'm uh, uh, enormously positive. Um, to quote Cher, it's a long and winding road, and I think it's always good to quote Cher. The, uh, I'm still, <laughs> uh, when Cher does it, it, it moves from being a cover to being uh, intrinsically valuable. Um, the, uh, always important to bring Cher into every meeting, but um, uh, I, uh, I did get promoted. I became an advisor and... Uh, then uh, I worked for Port Gaelic after that as Director of Education. When I was an advisor, an education advisor, one of the things we did was uh, school um, uh, inspections, basically. They were, they were called reviews. Um, and they were done by the local authority in a team, a squad. I mean, 15, 16 of us come in looking sharper than I'm looking today, but, you know, suits and all the rest of it and clipboards. And you, you uh, sample lessons and you create a report, which was quite a big deal in schools. It wasn't necessarily a public report, although you could get it if you wanted, but it was a big deal within the profession. And it graded schools really sharply. In other words, the authority was able to say what its schools were like. One of the last ones I was on was a secondary school, and I'm going to say what it was. It was Knightswood, because it's good. Um, and uh, I was chair, I think, of the team. I think I was lead, uh, lead officer. And what happens is the head teacher um, can suggest to you examples of good practice so that they go in the report. They want them in the report. Um, you know, something that's really good. In the, and the head teacher, who very able, and she got a very good HMIE report not long after this, was at me to try, and we have a very sharp timetable on for a week and you're, you know, period seven, period eight, period nine, you're, you're all kind of dotting about to make sure you get a breadth of experience and a breadth of observation and lots of meetings with different people. Absolutely insistent that we went to see this um, uh, piece of work that S3 had done where they'd created a PowerPoint on, on international gay and lesbian discrimination or something, and they were going to present it to S4, and it was the other way, but S4 were doing it for S3 as part of the PSE programme. 
And she wanted that as a, a, as a, a piece of a good practice that took place in the secondary school. That would not have happened um, many years before that. Head teacher, pressing the, inspect the, the, the review team from the local authority to get in period seven, Thursday afternoon. You've got to see it. It's really superb, high quality. Could you make sure that goes in our report? That was just inconceivable um, when I started teaching. It was inconceivable when I was a young person. I was, I, uh, uh, you know, st started secondary school in 1969. Inconceivable that anything like that would ever take place. So, as Tim said, the arc of history, you know, the long and winding road, as Cher said, it does move forward and things, uh, you'll probably be aware of the, the, the videos, it gets better. It does get better. It takes time, but I think it does get better. I think it gets better because we push for it. I don't think it gets better organically on its own. <laughs> I think it gets better it's because be people do things. But it's still, it gets better. And because we're running out of time, and if I could turn back time, Jim, I would. <laughs> Two shares. That's my friend show cancelled. Uh, Rona, what's the big takeaway? What's the big lesson that nowadays people... Yeah, I think can um, learn from what happened in the past. Yeah, one of like one of our kind of statements that we like to use quite a lot is that um, education is the most powerful tool we have to address prejudice, and we talk about this quite a lot. And I think ultimately that's the great harm of Section Twenty Eight is that it suppressed the ability for young people, for people who uh, are obviously now <laughs> more than fully grown adults, to learn to have that education, to have that understanding. Um, that's what was so insidious about it, is that it removed the ability for people to learn and understand others. And the fact is, is that now that we live in a long post Section 28 society, the importance of education, of getting to know people, of talking to people, um, I don't think ignorance, which is what drives prejudice and discrimination, can survive contact with the group that is the prejudice is about getting to know people, getting to talking to people, understanding their stories. We are so big um, on getting people to share their stories with each other, which I guess comes back to the idea of coming out, but just in general of making sure that voices of people who are often marginalised in society are heard, that especially young people, but frankly people of all ages, get the chance to hear about people who are not like them, who are different in some way. Um, is so vital and is the one thing that can really help to address and ultimately eliminate prejudice and discrimination, not just in schools, but across all of society. And um, it's been referred to many times in various LGBT campaigns through history, but the fact is with Section 28 and, and all these um, types of legal discrimination that come up, whether it is today or whether it is in the past, we cannot go back. There are people who want to take you back and we must keep pressing forward to not allow that to happen and to educate, to bring people in, not to push people away, but to make sure that we understand as a society, where do we want to go? Do we want to have a progressive society where everyone's included and we don't have this type of legislation? And if so, what work are we going to do to get us there? How are we going to help educate people? How are we going to bring people in? And uh, hopefully we are on a really good track at the moment with a lot of good data behind us to back it up that we are currently doing the right thing with that when it comes to LGBT inclusive education. But of course there is, as has been said, a lot more work still to do. Thank you very much and, and good luck with that. Um, that brings this session to a close. I am told to remind you that if you booked today through Eventbrite, you will receive a survey and the Parliament would be really grateful if you completed that survey. I'll ask a few questions about today's event. Um, I'd also personally like to thank our panel for taking time out uh, of their busy days and work lives to come and talk to us in the Parliament, to talk to you, to answer my questions and yours. And more importantly, I'd like to thank you for coming along. I know there's a lot else going on, a lot more funny topics to discuss, um, but I'm really, really grateful and pleased that you took time out of your day as well to come along and listen to our amazing panel and participate in, in today's Festival of Politics event. Um, and thank you for, for, for supporting me and sharing that. Um, we'll be around. Um, I think we're probably getting chucked out of the room, aren't we? Yeah, there'll be another event on. But we'll certainly be migrating our way out. And feel free to, to chat to any of us. I'm sure we'd be happy to, to chat to you. Um, get home safely and have a great rest of Festival and Fringe. Thank you. <laughs>